Hey everybody, DM Jim here and welcome to a new episode of the Tabletop Engineer. As you are watching this right now, I'm actually out of town. I've been out of town for a week, still haven't gotten home. So I'm recording this video about a week and a half early. It will be, um, there'll be a lot of editing. Uh, you'll probably see my shirt change here and there because I'm, uh, I'm taking questions from subscribers, uh, from Bexum subscribers, um, people on my Facebook, the Tabletop Engineer Facebook page. I'm just gathering all the questions. Some of you have emailed me. I've been collecting these for a while, and uh, I'm following Jeremy over at the Black Magic Craft. Uh, since I'm out of town, I don't want to, I don't want to not have a new video to upload. So I figured I'd take uh, take a chance and uh, respond to some of your questions that I've been collecting, and. Uh, <laughs> Some of the questions are funny. I, I guess you, I guess you want to know a little more about me, and I'm fine with that. I normally, I'm all about the crafting and sharing with you what I have. Uh, I'll obviously tell you what you want to know about me. But uh, some of the questions are just interesting about background and stuff like that. So, you know, if that's of interest to you, keep watching. So let me get started. Um, these are in no particular order. I just sort of cut and pasted them into um, a document. Uh, I, I think I put these in order of like how, how fast I thought I could respond to them. So let's get started. Uh, what games are you currently playing regularly? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, those of you who follow Facebook and this channel know that I am a big uh, Frostgrave fan. Uh, I play Frostgrave at least once a month. Uh, I hope to, I sometimes try to play it twice a month. It's hard to say. I do get to play a lot of solo Frostgrave. Because in the Bexham's Bazaar magazine, um, there's a 10-part solo Frostgrave campaign that I've been developing and playtesting, and then I put it in the magazine. So I am playing that. Uh, it's not against an opponent, but it's fun. Uh, I play D&D on Wednesday nights. I rarely get to play D&D any time other than that, uh, just for time reasons. It's uh, Once a week is enough. I'm the DM, not a player. So uh, I have to put a lot of, you know, sometimes I put a little bit of time, sometimes I put a lot of time. Sometimes it's usually it's in the middle. And uh, so D&D takes a big chunk of my time. Uh, I play Gaslands, not as often as I like. That is a car vehicle combat. Uh, I don't have one with me. Do I have one with me? Uh, I thought maybe I had one close that I could show you that I'd made, but uh, it's a fun game. What else am I playing? Uh, I also play Star Wars Legion. Very, very rare. Uh, I'm trying to change that. I have a group of friends here in Atlanta who we are all just trying to find the time to come together and play a game. I play the Rebels. I don't even have my Empire, uh, you know, minis painted. I probably should, uh, but I just, I don't, I don't play the Empire. I like the Rebels. Always have. Uh, I play a lot of board games. Um, I play those typically with my, my family or just occasionally whenever I can find the time. I have some friends here local. We'll play a board game. Usually play at the local gaming stores that are frequent. Uh, I do play a lot of solo games. Uh, I play Arkham Horror card game. Uh, I play Mansions of Madness, which is another um, of Fantasy Flight's. Uh, these are Cthulhu-based games. I like I like Cthulhu. I like the mythology there. And so Mansions of Madness is very fun. I play that solo because the game can be led by an iPad app. And I have very few friends that like to play the Cthulhu games. So I tend to play those solo. Other than that, that's about it. I mean, obviously there's other games I'd like to play. Um, but I just either don't have opponents or I don't have time. There's a brand new game that is coming out in August called Reality's Edge. It is a skirmish war game. Uh, that takes place in a cyberpunk uh, theme world, and uh, I definitely will be playing that. If I can find some opponents here in Atlanta, I will be playing that game. I'm a huge cyberpunk geek and uh, just love that concept. And the rule book is like 300 pages, which sounds overwhelming, but a lot of it's just resource material for your for your soldiers. Like, you know, there's hackers and mercenaries, and so you have weapons and you have software and things like that. So it, it definitely makes sense that it's a little bit of a longer, uh, longer rule book. Oh, <laughs> Operation Last Train. Uh, I have been playing, and man, I owe the money. Uh, Operation Last Train is a um, solo or cooperative science fiction skirmish game. You kind of play Marines fighting against aliens and bugs and stuff, and you rescue civilians. And for every civilian you rescue, you're supposed to make a donation to save the children of 10 cents. 
And I think at this point I've played it enough that I've probably saved like three or four dollars worth of <laughs> civilians. I was kind of thinking I would get, build up like 10 or 20 and make one big donation, but it's been a while, so I probably need to go ahead and do that. Oops. If you want to check it out, uh, just Google Operation Last Train. You'll, you'll find Joseph McCullough is the author and you'll, you'll find a link, I'm sure, to the rule book. This one was interesting. What type of engineer, engineer are you and what is your background? Ooh, that's, that's a wide ranging question. Um, when I was in college, I studied engineering. Specifically, I studied industrial engineering. I also got an English degree. I knew at a very early age, uh, early in high school, that I wanted to be a technical writer. Uh, I liked science, math, and I liked reading and writing. And a teacher put me on to the career of technical writing, and the more I read about it, the more I realized that's what I want to do. So going into college, I was very focused. Um, went for the engineering degree, went for the English degree. Uh, for industrial, I really didn't practice industrial, for, but for maybe a year after college. Uh, by that time, the companies that were hiring me, uh, the company that hired me out of college hired me for the English degree. They wanted me to write their user manuals. And then I took a job in Texas with a company that wanted me to write their processes manuals. And um, so I didn't do a lot of engineering. Uh, I still have the knowledge. It's old. <laughs> it's out of date. A lot of it's out of date. I did get a lot of um, experience with robotics. Not a lot, but enough. A little bit of electrical, things like that. Um, and what that allowed me to do was to have a basic understanding of robotics because in 2006, Lego reached out to me and wanted me to participate in a beta <coughs> program they were doing. They were releasing a new robot kit called the NXT. And I ended up writing, um, they basically wanted to release the robot kit, but they wanted some books to be available on the bookshelves for parents and teachers and kids. And so a publisher reached out to me and coordinated with me and Lego. Lego got me the beta uh, robot kit, which came in a garbage bag. I kid you not. Um, it, it was in a box, but when I lifted it out, it was like a hefty sack filled with just motors and sensors and plastic pieces all in a bag. I had to sort it out. It was crazy. But I ended up writing a book for that called The Mayan Adventure. Um, the book did very well. Uh, it was pretty much one of the very first books out um, for the NXT. It used a fictional story to um to teach kids and teachers and parents how to build robots but there was a there was a you know a brainstorming part of the book and then there was a programming aspect and a building aspect so it was um I was really proud of that book and I still continue to this day to get royalties off of it it still sells uh this is what 13 years later and um you know so that led to more books lego books i think i wrote in all about 6 lego books and after that, I switched over to just a um, wide range of topics. I wrote on CNC machines, 3D printers, robotics, uh, electronics, um, uh, open source software. I did some books on that. I did. I was all over the place. I was a jack of all trades when it came to writing. My, my publishers, I wrote for five publishers in all over a period of about 10 years. Um, my publishers would just, they would either say, hey, what do you want to write on? Or they would say, hey, here's a subject. Can you write a book on it? And if I didn't feel qualified to write it, I would either say no, not qualified, or they would give me three months or six months to learn something and then write the book. And that's how I got into like 3D printing. I really had to dive into 3D printing. And then I wrote a book with a friend of mine, Patrick, out in Texas. Um, we wrote a book, uh, How to Build Your Own CNC Machine. Then we wrote one called How to Build Your Own 3D Printer, which I do not recommend buying those books and doing. The, the 3D printers, that, that, that printer was like seven or $800 made out of wood and clutched together electronics. It worked, but don't recommend it. Buy a 3D printer if that's what you want. Uh, so that's my background, technical writer. Somebody wrote another question. They said, uh, you're an author. What books have you written um, or where are your books? You can get a lot of my books are still being sold on Amazon. Now, technical writers, technology books typically go out of uh, you know, they're, they're just, they don't have a long shelf life. You know, if you write something on Word 2000 in 2002, that book's obsolete, sort of. So, uh, a lot of my books are still available, but they're obsolete. Um, and then there's some like the Lego books that still continue to sell, I guess, because the people, even though it's a different robot kit out now, it's called the EV3. Um, even though it's a different robot kit, the story and the prototyping and the programming and building theory has not changed. So I guess I, I do understand why that book is still going. 
So yeah, um, my books can be, if you search James Floyd Kelly on Amazon, you'll find my books. Most of them get pretty good reviews. There's a couple on there that for some reason I got pegged with like one or two stars. I don't, I usually don't look at that stuff. My wife does. Um, I figure for every one negative, there's probably 50 or a hundred that liked it, just didn't respond. So anyway, jumping around here, sorry, I, somebody had asked about the author. Where did you get your goggles? Um, I don't remember. I bought them online from Germany. They were, uh, they were called welder's goggles, even though I don't get that. I guess I do because they're, they're glass and they would protect your eyes from like, um, sparks, but welding, uh, uh, -uh you would not use these with welding. Maybe they got the name welder's goggles for some other reason, but they're not, you know, they're not dark. Um, I don't know, but they're, they're apparently they are real. I mean, they're metal and glass. So I think somebody must use them for something, but I saw them online. Uh, I bought a couple pair. I just thought they were really cool looking. And, um, when I, when I do woodworking or I used to do a lot of woodworking, I liked them rather than the big goggles, uh, cause they kept, um, sawdust from flying up, you know, they're, they're, they, they seal pretty well over your eyes. So I, I liked them. And because they were flat and clear, I thought I would get a, uh, a better vision and also they're glass. So, um, they, and they've got ventilation, so they don't fog up. So anyway, long story short, online called Weller's Goggles, <coughs> but honestly, I, I ordered them so long ago, I couldn't tell you where, where I ordered them or where I got them, but it was Germany. Uh, let's see. Uh, what cons do you attend? What cons will you be attending? Are you willing to travel and teach? That's three questions. You broke the rule. No, I'm kidding. Um, what cons do you attend? Typically, I attend Gen Con. This, I'm attending this uh, 2019. I've attended the last four, five years, four years, five years. Uh, I enjoy Gen Con, but I think this is going to be my last year at Gen Con for a while, or I may go to every other year. Gen Con is just getting very expensive. Uh, it's getting very difficult to um, get into a game you wanna play. I, I go to Gen Con because I want to see the new games that are coming out, the new RPGs, the new board games, and I wanna have a chance to sit down and test them and play them, uh, and they fill up. I mean, most game companies, they'll, they'll schedule like two or three official, you know, uh, events with four to 10 players. And then when it fills up, you're out of luck. They don't open up more. So this year I, I, I registered for 10 different events that I wanted to play in and I only got one. And no, last year I got three. I thought that was bad. So this year, um, this year I've only got one event. Now the, the good side is it'll give me a lot more time to walk around and look at stuff. And you can always find games to just sit down and, and play. But what I'm talking about are new games, games that are like very, special situations like maybe you want to play with a certain player or a certain dm or whatever and those fill up too fast and that's just a problem with gen con and it's i'm not trying to be whiny here a lot of people have complained about it i just for the cost of the hotel and the cost of the airfare and food and all that it's just not a, a smart convention for me to attend uh, anymore uh, especially the money i spend on gen con could probably cover me going to three or four smaller conventions now, traditionally, I go to Gen Con because I also write for a website called geekdad.com. And um, even though Geek Dad didn't pay for my hotel, uh, they did cover some stuff. And they always managed to hook me up with other Geek Dad writers. And so we could share a hotel room or we would cover one another for interviews and things like that. So I don't... Uh, anyway, Gen Con was the big one. Next year, 2020, I will be attending Gary Con for the first time. Never been to Gary Con. Looking very forward to it. I've heard so good, so many good things about it, and I know what it's all about. And I'm, I'm an old Gary Gygax fan. I grew up playing D and D, and so this is sort of like homecoming for me, uh, going to Wisconsin. And even though Gary's not with us anymore, and I never was fortunate enough to meet him, uh, the fact that they have a convention in his name and his honor, and they play RPGs and. I'm really looking forward to it. And I hear that it is not as crazy as Gen Con in terms of hotel and, you know, getting there and, and getting into events and stuff. In 10 years, who knows? That may change. Gary Con may become a new Gen Con. But right now they say it's pretty easy to get in. So I'm going to try it. And I will probably be doing a live event or two or uh, an episode of, of the Tabletop Engineer from Gary Con next year when I go. All right, what else? Uh, Mace. I attended Mace in 2018. That's in Charlotte, North Carolina in November. I attended it for the first time and had a blast. It was so much fun. I met Scotty, uh, Bill, or Wylock of Wylock's Armory. I met V. 
Um, I met Danny Herrera, the 3D tabletop engineer or tabletop printer. Um, it was really cool to get us all together. I don't think it was planned so much. I, I was just going to go and I found out Scotty's going and I found out V's going and Bill's going. This year, Jeremy's going from Black Magic Craft and DM, and, uh, Gareth from GM, DMG Info. Blah, 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 all these letters. Um, they're going too. So this year, Mace is really, I'm looking forward to it. It's of all the events this year, I'm looking forward to. That's the one. That's the key. Uh, so, um, if you are looking for a small convention that you could go to that's not unreasonably priced, check out Mace. M-A-C-E, uppercase. Uh, it's in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's November. 8th, 9th, and 10th, or 10th, 11th, 12th, something like that. Anyway, um, what else? Uh, in July, I am the tabletop crew chief. Actually, I'm one of two tabletop crew chiefs for Southern Fried Gaming, Gaming Expo here in Atlanta. Uh, it started out with as pinball and video arcade games. That was six years ago or five years ago. Um, it has, uh, a couple years ago, they opened up a tabletop section of the game uh, in the hotel and it has exploded so it's actually getting bigger and bigger every year they're expecting over 4,000 people this year um, we're giving away hundreds of games like play and win board games we're going to have D&D other RPGs we're going to have some war gaming there's tournaments uh, I'm really looking forward to that one because I'm involved in it I won't be doing so much I won't get to play as much uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to do some if you're going to try to make SFGE in July, it's here in Atlanta. Uh, look for me. Uh, I'd love to say hello. That's all I have right now. Next year, I would like to try to, to attend Origins. Uh, everybody seems to be flocking to Origins, and I hear such good things about it. So I think next year I may attend Origins. One thing I do want to do next year, if I can, is attend Adepticon. It's a wargaming uh, convention, mainly wargaming. I, I, they probably do RPGs and board games, but as I understand it, it's wargaming. And uh, even though I'm not a Warhammer 40k player, uh, I got to imagine there's some Frostgrave players there and maybe some other war games. And this Reality's Edge that I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping that uh, that game releases in uh, September, I think. So hopefully by next year, Adepticon, there'll be some Reality's Edge Cyberpunk players. So we'll see. But that's it for um, that's it for conventions. Uh, how to eliminate wisps? This one comes from a friend of mine, Kemper. Um, Hang on. Oh, I didn't unplug it. Hang on. Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I just didn't pull it over here. I use this. This is a hot air gun. Much hotter than a hair dryer. I, a hair dryer will work, but uh, some hair dryers, I believe, do not get hot enough to really do it. So what you do, and I don't have a, I don't have one to here to demonstrate, but for instance, if you've got wisps, hot glue wisps off of uh, a craft like my towers or whatever, I turn it on and I don't point it at the object. I let it get good and hot. And you'll see the, the nozzle here will get bright red if you use the high, high setting. There's a low and a high. And once it's good and hot, I just go, I hold the object and I just go by it real fast like that. I don't put it on there and hold it because it will melt the glue. It will melt plastic from 3D printed objects. Um, it will bubble paint. So you got to be careful with this, but for wisps, it will cause them to curl up. When they get that first blast of hot air, they'll curl up or they'll remelt. And because they get a little heavy, they, they'll fall and attach themselves to the wall or whatever. So that's how I do it. And um, you just have to trust me. It works. Works pretty well. Most memorable moment as a DM. Uh, ooh, I, I actually had an answer to this and I just went blank on it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so got to set the scene. I normally am not a, a, in my DMing, I usually don't kill players like vindictively. If they make a bad roll or make a bad decision, I let the dice land where they may. Uh, I rarely try to pigeonhole my, um, players into, you know, going down that hallway or make going east and you can't go west. You got to go this way. So I let my players do a lot of, you know, their own actions and ramifications. We'll see what happens. So this was a couple of years ago. I had some players. Uh, I can't remember which adventure it was. It was the one with the uh, Eric Hokra, the tower. Ah, I just went blank on it. I think it was the elemental, elemental adventure. But they managed to get to the top of a tower and they got captured. And um, 
they the players didn't know it, but these winged Eric Coker, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, they were watching them from afar. They knew that these were good guys that were fighting these bad guys in the tower. And so um two you know, the the captain of the guard caught the players red handed and wanted to set an example and he said, you know, six of you here, two of you are, are going to die. Um, and he said, you know, who will it be? And uh, I think nobody spoke up, and I rolled randomly. And so I picked uh, Edith was, was her name. And who was the other one? I can't recall who the other player was. Um, picked two players. And the guards took them to the edge of this, of this high keep. I mean, they were, you know, you can't, you're not going to survive a fall. And they threw them over. Edith's husband, George, who's a friend of mine, he's no, they're no longer play at my table. They moved away, but George is a good guy, very good guy. But let me, and there, he's married to Edith. The look he gave me <laughs> um, when I threw his wife's character over the tower. Wow. I mean, he was not a happy player. Um, and, and I, and I get it because as a DM, you know, I didn't give them a choice to fight. I didn't give them any, any way to get out of it. It was just bye over the tower. What I didn't tell him what, and that was where the, 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 uh, the adventure that night ended. Okay. I took their character sheets from them, implying that that, that was that. It was the next week when I explained that as they were flying over the edge and falling to their deaths, Two of these flying creatures came up and saved them. And uh, actually, they took them to another level on the thing. They were able to come up and rescue their companions, all that. But it was memorable, not because it was any great DMing, but it was just the the look on George's face when I threw Edith's character over the uh, the wall. He didn't care about the other player. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure he did, but it was it was the fact that I targeted his wife's character. Um, that was, that was memorable. There are probably others that I could come up with, but you asked for one. There you go. Uh, will, will, would you be willing to collaborate with other channels, newer channels? Absolutely. Um, collaborating with YouTube channels, uh, can be tricky, obviously. I mean, you know, uh, unless you're doing some sort of live crafting where you're using Hangout or something where both people can see each other, it's, it's a little tricky. Uh, I did a collaborative project with Bill, Wylock's Armory, a while back. Um, we were basically building two separate things, and we were using this little LED thing, kind of like Tony Stark wears on his chest. It was just a light-up little LED. And um, so in order to do that, some of you may not want to know this, but, you know, because uh, you don't want to know how things work behind the scenes. But Bill and I basically scripted that, okay? And we filmed our individual pieces. Like I told Bill what was going to be in my video and what I needed him to read or say, and he provided that. He did the same. He would, he would say, I need you to, to do this or, you know, act like, like I painted my goggles red and put them down. And I was like, who painted my goggles red? That was him. That was his idea. So, um, we, we collaborated in that way in, in, in we, in the sense that we made a humorous video. Uh, we didn't collaborate on a project, so to speak. Those are tricky. Now, I know people have done it, but um, am I open to it? You know, I'm always open to encouraging new channels, younger channels, uh, new crafters, uh, any way I can. If it's a brief mention of them here or in Bexham's Bazaar magazine, I'm happy to do it. If you can come up with a good way to do a collaborative video that works, um, you know, let me know. I, I'm not, I'm, I can't think of anything off the top of my head of how that would work. Um, you know, somebody one time said, Oh, you know what? I'll, how about you send me something and you do something to it? Then you send me and I'll do something to it. And that could take weeks or months. And that's just, I don't think viewers are going to want to hang in there for something that's spread out over a real long period of time. So, uh, so yes, if you are a young channel and you're looking to, you know, for some, uh, some new viewers, I'm happy to give you a, a, a little bit of promotion. Uh, I'm happy, happy to introduce you in an upcoming video. Um, obviously I need to see that you have a channel that's going. I mean, don't say, Hey, my first episode's coming out. Can you do this? Get started. Figure out what your voice is. As a matter of fact, I'm jumping ahead because remember the question I told you I was skipping. I'm going to come back to it. That question was, do you have any advice for a new channel, new crafter? So let me jump to the advice for a new channel question and that hopefully will answer or help answer some of the questions for you who are wanting collaboration. 
Um, advice for a new channel is a little tricky. Uh, I am certainly not an expert. Uh, guys like Jeremy and, and DM Scotty, go look at their viewership and, uh, you know, they're doing something right. Um, my viewership is growing little by little, but I don't, I don't check it. I don't, I don't worry about it because I'm not monetizing it. Um, but I guess if I were going to monetize my YouTube channel, maybe I would, you know, look for ways to, to uh, improve my channel and, and do that. So I can't really offer much advice to you in terms of that. If you want to monetize a crafting channel, I'm not your guy. Now, what I can tell you, and I think most of the, the, the YouTuber crafters that you know, like Scotty and V and Bill and Jeremy and such, I think they would probably all agree with me when I tell you that if you don't enjoy making stuff for your gaming needs or whatever, if you're just wanting to do a crafting channel just because you think it would be cool and, and, um, you know, you want to, you want people to follow your, your, your channel, that's not going to get you through it. Um, you know, you, you need to be excited about, about making terrain and stuff because otherwise you're going to get bored and you're going to stop doing it or it's going to come across in the video. I think, I think it would. Uh, you need to not worry about numbers. You need to worry about are you going to be able to deliver something, you know, on a regular basis? Is it going to be something that people are going to want to make or, or duplicate? Um, is it, is it something so complicated that, you know, two viewers might attempt it? Um, I try not to do any crafts. I try not to any crafts that I don't think others could do. Okay. My tower, my goblin tower looks all complicated and crazy or whatever, but it, it was pretty simple. I mean, it's, you know, dowels and chipboard. It's the vision, it's the envisioning what you want to make that can be a little tricky. And I think the more you do it, uh, you get better at it. Your creativity floodgates, so to speak, they open and you start coming up with more ideas. But um, advice would be, you know, you got to, I changed my name. I, this channel used to be Game Terrain Engineering, which worked for me for a while. But then I realized I wanted to do stuff other than just terrain. So I went with the tabletop engineer, figuring that was sort of an umbrella that would allow me to deviate every now and then from terrain, but still stay in the gaming tabletop area. And the word engineer implies that usually I'm trying to make something or, or create something that, uh, that requires some, you know, some thought and planning. <clears throat> come up with a good name for your channel. Uh, you can come up with a good logo. You don't need the logo right away, but you got to have a name that lets people know what you're about. Uh, you need to, you actually need to shoot a video. I, I know a lot of people have intentions of creating a video. Uh, but as a writer, I can tell you, I know a lot of people say, I want to be a writer. Well, to be a writer, you actually got to write. Uh, you know, even if you're not published, you got to sit down and write. If you want to be a YouTube crafter for gaming, uh, you got to start making stuff. And, uh, your early videos will probably, you know, you'll look back at them like I do at mine and go, Oh, golly, you know, um, but you got to start somewhere. So my advice is, uh, you know, get started. Figure out if, if that's what you want to do. Do you have longevity? Are you going to be able to take it, you know, past, say, 10 videos or five videos? If you can get past 10 or 20 videos, you're, you're doing something, right? Uh, you've got the drive to keep it going. Uh, but, and, and hopefully if what you're doing is good, the, the, the subscribers will follow. Um, Jeremy has a hundred and I forget how many, over a hundred thousand. I know he hit a hundred thousand at some point. Um, he, he hit a hundred thousand subscribers, a hundred thousand people tune in to Jeremy to see what he's making each week. I think that's phenomenal. Um, I, I have, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000, 6,000, I think. Um, and to me, that's fine. I mean, that means that there are people out there who enjoy watching what I do. I'm not worried about when am I going to hit 100,000? I don't know when I'm going to hit 7,000. So, you know, if you're going to worry about your numbers, uh, it's going to, it's going to take your mind off of what your channel's really about, which is showing how to make stuff or how you make stuff. Uh, if you're going to make a tutorial channel, you need to make sure you include enough narration and stuff so that people have enough information they could duplicate it. If you're just showing off stuff you've made, then just narrate it. Say, yeah, look at this. This is what I made. Um, and you may get questions about how did you do this or what did you do for this and stuff like that. But if you actually want to make a crafting video and show people how to duplicate what you do, you're going to have to think about it. Uh, it's going to require camera. It's going
It's going to require software for editing. Um, you're going to, you're going to need to spend some time learning how to do those things properly so that you improve, so that your videos improve. So that's, that's about all I have on that. Um, you know, uh, I enjoy it. I still enjoy it. I took a three month break, which was about two months longer than I really wanted. A one month break would be great occasionally. So give yourself a break. Don't say you're going to release a new video every, <clears throat> every day, every week for the next five years. Don't make promises you can't deliver. Um, and, uh, but if you do say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to release a video every Friday, do your best to do it. Now, you know, we're all human. We know that sometimes things happen. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want subscribers to keep, continue to follow you, uh, deliver on what you tell them you're going to deliver and you should do okay. All right. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> do you communicate with V, Scotty, Jeremy, Bill, etc.? <laughs> I communicate. Yes. I don't. I don't usually talk to them on the phone. It's mostly email and Facebook. Uh, v is probably, I think V is one of the better ones for keeping us sort of all together. Um, she, she occasionally, you know, uses a Facebook messenger or something and, uh, we'll, we'll blast out a question to the group and stuff. And, uh, she's pretty good about that. I do occasionally email Jeremy or Bill and, and DM Scotty. Um, I email Gareth, DMG info. I, uh, I sometimes talk on the phone with, um, Danny Herrero. Not often, but every now and then. But yeah, we do communicate. We don't communicate face to face because we're all scattered. Jeremy's in Canada. I think Scotty's in Ohio. V's in New Jersey. Oh, Bill, I don't know where you are. I know where he is, but I just can't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, Gareth is in, uh, Australia. So we're, we're scattered, but yeah, um, it's funny. I, every now and then I'll just get an email from Bill or Jeremy or somebody asking a question and I'll respond or whatever. And I, it, it's, you know, the courtesies there and, and I'll, I, and I, and I think the respect, I mean, uh, I love these guys. I love these gals, G, V included. Uh, I met V and Scotty and Danny and Bill for the first time last year at Mace and, it was funny, you know, you see him face to face and even me, I was like, Oh, this is Scotty. There he is. But, uh, it was instant, you know, camaraderie, uh, sort of like, okay, I know what we're doing. V was the funniest one. She just came up, gave me a hug and it was right back to, you know, work. And I, I was too. And so, um, it's funny. We do communicate. We do, uh, we do share stuff with one another. But, uh, because of our, because of the, um, the geography of it, uh, we don't see each other face to face that often, only at conventions mainly. So, um, anyway, th that is that side of the questions. My voice is starting to go. So I'm going to take a break and I'll come back later and do some more questions. So let's see. Um, what is your favorite project? And there's a follow up question. What is your favorite project from another crafter? Good questions. Um, oh man, my favorite project. Uh, doo -doo, that's tough. I mean, they're like children, right? I mean, there are some that I'm not too fond of. <laughs> they were uh, either old or, you know, just didn't feel like I hit the mark. Uh, and then there's some that I, I'm just so proud of. I'm, I'm very proud of the Goblin series of buildings I did. Um, not because they were complex or difficult to do. I just like that they, they're they cohesive. When you see them all together um, on the tabletop, it's just cool looking to see something that large. I've never done any kind of diorama to that size. And that now is, let's see, it's 23, 29, 36. I think that's six videos in all. Uh, that's the Goblin uh, Watchtower, which was the first one I made, which is this little square rectangular shaped one. And then from there, I made the Bastion, the Fortress, the Barracks, the Blimp. Was that it? And then I made the uh, Wizard Tower. That one right there. <laughs> right there. Um, I'm very proud of those. Uh, they're just, you know, there's something that when I finished, I felt very good about. And I've also gotten just a lot of compliments, a lot of people... Uh, telling me they like it. A lot of people duplicating it and making their own. So kind of glad to be the inspiration there. Um, what is your favorite project from another crafter? Man, that's another tough one. Um, you know, I watch, I watch a lot of crafting videos. I watch, uh, DM Scotty, obviously, and Wylock and Jeremy and V and DMG Info 
and Danny's 3D printing stuff, man. Um, there's a lot of smaller uh, crafting channels that are just getting started. I watch those. If I had to pick a favorite, that's tough. Uh, I can tell you some of my favorites. Uh, one that jumps to mind um, is DM Scotty's uh, isometric um, videos. There's a bunch of those, but they are they are really what got me thinking in a different direction. Um, mainly because I I have a player at my table who. Uh, you know, I used to be, I used to print like two inch high walls for my dungeons and I would build these really tall designs. And what I found was is that one or two, actually two of my players were having trouble seeing, uh, from where they were sitting, seeing down. So when I saw DM Scotty's, um, isometric system where he basically removed the walls. And, you know, there's doors and windows and things, but the idea is that you, you use flat terrain, but you use elements to give a three dimensional, um, uh, you know, feel without blocking the vision, uh, the view uh, around. And so that was an eye opener for me. And, and I do a lot of that with my, um, my own D and D game where I don't do high walls anymore, not unless it really requires some sort of three dimensional design, but I prefer to let the player's imagination fill in the walls and, you know, windows and things like that. And I'll put doors and stuff in where it's needed. Um, but, but, uh, you know, I leave it to the player's imagination. Now, um, Wylock obviously has had a lot of, uh, Bill, you know, William Bill at, at Wylock's Armory. Um, he, He's done, I would say recently, and when I say recently, within a few months, he's been doing a lot of uh, base design for his, um, like, Warhammer uh, 40K, and or his, he does the one rule, uh, uh, one page rule set, um, science fiction stuff, and I've really been enjoying his take on science fiction terrain. Uh, he's been doing this for some time. Uh, one that jumps to mind was, the, the uh, tower or, it, you know, there are LEDs that sort of go up. I, I can't remember which video it is, but I loved that one um, because it took something I enjoy, which is electronics, and it put it inside uh, a really cool piece of terrain that guaranteed if you were to put that on a wargaming table at a local gaming store, it would grab attention. It would have people come over and they just stare at it and say, man, that is awesome. Uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, I mean, where do I start? He, uh, well, first off, his chapel, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the um, the uh, the chapel he did. I, I don't want to say it's an evil chapel, but dark chapel or something like that. Um, that thing was pretty cool. Uh, I'm still, in the back of my mind, formulating a chapel of my own because uh, I've seen other people make their versions. But I just haven't attempted it yet because it was so good. I mean, you know... <clears throat> um, if I need one, I'll make it, but right now I don't need one, and so that just stands out as a really, really cool project. V, <laughs> v does, man, V does these really surprising little projects for little things that we take for granted in a game. She'll do fences, and she'll do, like, doors, and she'll do, um, she'll do these little projects that make these, uh, these, I call it scatter terrain, but it's really not scatter terrain. It is elements of a tabletop, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or fantasy style game. And she just puts them out like crazy. Um, it, it's, uh, it's amazing how much of those, how many of those she comes up with. Uh, and they're always, I have to give her props. They're always really easy to follow and duplicate. And that, that alone right there uh, tells you about her crafting skill is that um, she can make these things so simple and uh, and make them easy to duplicate. Uh, her videos are, in my opinion, they're they're really well done in terms of tutorials. Uh, you know, DMG Info, uh, I, I don't really have a favorite of his. I love his use of cardboard. The guy can take cardboard and make anything. Um, it's, it's just crazy what he does. I have used his doors, his dungeon doors. I've done those before. So I, I know I refer to that video often whenever I need to make some fast 
dungeon doors that I don't want to 3D print <clears throat> or make real extravagant, I hit DMG info every time. I have to rewatch that video to make his uh, dungeon doors out of cardboard. Um, you know, I could go on and on. Um, I don't have a favorite. I just know that there are videos from all of those folks that I go back and I rewatch over and over again. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, where do you game? I, I assume that you mean like gaming stores. I do not run a home game. That may change one day. Um, I, I every now and then I entertain the idea of building a, uh, a gaming table here in my basement and inviting some friends to come and, you know, once a week or once a month, whatever, and play a game. Uh, I haven't done it yet. Uh, a lot of it's time, but traditionally for the past few years, I have played Dungeons and Dragons as a DM. I have played at a local uh, store called Titan Games and Comics. It's here in Atlanta. Specifically, I believe their address is in Smyrna, Georgia, which is where I live. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's very easy to get to. I can get there and back in 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes. Um, they host Adventurers League every Wednesday night. Uh, the crew that works there, which currently is Leo, Katie, Mike, and, uh, Leo, Katie, Mike, and Jay, um, they, they open up the doors. They don't charge players to come and play. Uh, they use meetup.com, uh, to sign up for, uh, play. They have four tables currently, <clears throat> seven people per table, one DM, six players. And they're going to, as I understand it, open up a fifth table, I think in September for the next season that starts. So five tables times seven is 35 players. Um, now I don't play D and D at another store, Gigabytes. Uh, it's called Gigabytes Cafe. It's in Marietta, Georgia. Where I go to Gigabytes for is for war gaming. Uh, I play a lot of Frostgrave there. I play, um, uh, I've played a little bit of Gaslands and I've played one game of, um, of, uh, just went blank on it. <laughs> uh, kill, kill, kill team, uh, with a friend of mine, Sebastian. And, uh, Gigabytes is, is sort of the place to go for war gaming, in my opinion. They do have a lot of D&D tables and I know that, uh, Wednesday night is their traditional D&D. And Saturdays and Sundays, they usually have a lot of uh, D&D games going on. But I do D&D at Titans. I do Wargaming at Gigabytes. There are a lot of game stores in and around the Atlanta area. Uh, Hobbytown USA, I, I've i been there a few times. Uh, it's a little too far of a drive for me. It's in Kennesaw and uh, just too far of a drive. But great location if you live in that area. A lot of tables, big room. Uh, and there's, there's more, um, there's Meeple Madness, um, what else, there's, uh, man, uh, I don't know them all, but there are a lot. So if you ever get to Atlanta, you're not going to, you're not going to hurt for, uh, finding a gaming store, uh, in your area. This one was interesting. Favorite D and D module. Wow. Uh, as you can tell, I haven't really, I read these questions, but I really didn't give much thought to it ahead of time. Uh, I started playing D and D in 1980. Uh, I got the, uh, I don't know what they call it. It's not the red box. It's the one that came before that. It was called Basic Dungeons and Dragons. It had a dragon on the cover sitting on top of a pile of gold. It had a wizard and a fighter looking in the room. And uh, it came with Keep, Keep on the Borderlands was the module inside. And then it came with a blue rule book about that thick that took you from levels one, two, and three, if I remember right. Uh, I played that for for maybe half a year with my friends. I was usually the DM because I, you know, I introduced the game and it just appealed to me. But also there just weren't a lot of people that wanted to DM, so I kind of fell into that. That transition to advanced Dungeons and Dragons, I remember the day I, my mom and dad for a gift got me the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. And uh, that was all she wrote for me. That book, uh, um, <laughs> it, it uh, changed changed my gaming, uh, opened up a lot of doors for me. And um, so when you ask what my favorite D&D module would, would, was, it's going to be an advanced Dungeons & Dragons module, and it's hard to say. I loved uh, Expedition to Barrier Peaks. I loved uh, The Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh which was the start of a trilogy called the U series of modules. 
Tomb of Horrors, obviously. I just, uh, I have a lot of them. I have, I think I have all of the pastel modules. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, the first 10 or 12 modules that were released for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, they came in uh, covers that opened up with a map inside and they were these pastel colors. And uh, I had most of them. And the ones I didn't have, I've managed to collect over the over the years. But um, any of those modules just bring back really good memories. Um, so uh, yeah, there you go. All the early Advanced Dungeons and Dragons modules are favorites of mine. First D and D version. Well, I covered that. It was the uh, what they call the basic D and D set. And um, uh, when I, I remember opening the box, now here's a funny story. Most a lot of people already know this story. My parents had asked me what I wanted for Christmas, and I told them I wanted the dungeon board game. Now, if you've not played it, Jeremy over at Black Magic Craft recently did a game review of Dungeon, the board game. Fun game. I loved it. Played it once. Wanted my own copy. Now, this is back in 1980. My parents had no clue. So they went and they got Dungeon. Well, I opened up my present and it was the basic Dungeons and Dragons box, <coughs> which was not what I wanted. I didn't know about D&D, but I opened that rule book on Christmas Day, sat down, started reading it, and my mind... Oh, uh, I realized, man, this is a very cool game. So uh, somehow, some way, a friend of mine also got the game, and we were able to figure out that there was a group of Dungeons & Dragons players in Pensacola, Florida, that met in Sears, the, the, the shopping center. And they had a back room that Sears allowed them to use. I don't know if a player worked there or what, but they had a room. And uh, I went there with a friend of mine, and the first night we went there, all the D&D tables, I think there were two tables, they had enough players, they didn't have any room. And there was a guy over here who said, I'll take you. We went over, and instead of playing Dungeons & Dragons, he was running a game called Metamorphosis Alpha, which I'd never heard of. But we sat down, we rolled up these mutants, and we played this game of Metamorphosis Alpha, Metamorphosis Alpha which was the first RPG I ever played. And I played that a couple more times, but uh, depending on how early you got there, you got a seat at the D&D table or not. But eventually I got to play D&D &D with a real DM, see how they played it. And that's when I switched over to DM and I started being a DM for the players. And we had about six or seven players uh, in sixth grade, my friends, and we would meet once a week or once every other week at somebody's house and play D&D. &D. So first D&D &D version was the basic set, but that didn't last long. We moved on to advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, this one came in, uh, this one came in this morning. Could I see a close up of your towers? I assume you're talking about the towers that I usually have sitting back here. Um, so I've taken a couple of them off. Um, I hit the tower with a very dark, dark black paint. And so it doesn't show the little goblins tower, which is next to it. You can see on a previous video. Uh, over here, I pulled up the, um, the towers. This is the dwarf. Dwarven Fortress, I think is what they call it. It is a printable scenery.com 3D model. Uh, it is heavy, as you can expect, and it is now painted. And um, I've had a few people say they don't like the blue trim. You can see the blue trim on the windows here and here, but I like it. Um, what I did was printable scenery has one painted. They had a blue roof and red trim. So I just basically reversed their color scheme and went with a red roof and blue trim and then a gold, you know, with all the dwarven stuff and the stairs turned out just phenomenal. I love it. Um, I, I, I used this just recently, a few days back. Um, I played a game of Frostgrave and we use this as the centerpiece. And one of the, my opponent's, uh, illusionist, um, or I was, I think he was an illusionist managed to get his apprentice up here and she was invisible. So I couldn't target her and she was just watching, waiting for her time to strike. She just stayed right here. It kind of irritated me. I couldn't couldn't really do much about it because you kind of have to throw the idea that you don't know she's there, even though I could physically see the the miniature there. Had to pretend otherwise. Um, this model is somewhat fragile, so I have to be very careful. This is the Elven Tower, and I haven't finished it yet. I've got to do the tree. I've I've done the roof and the trim work and all the details. There's three colors here. There's a metallic purple, a metallic blue and a metallic green. These are all plaid paints um, that I just like the way they shimmer. And it just felt right. Um, let me see if I can move that closer to you. It's a, it's just a great looking centerpiece. Uh, I'm not a big elf guy. I like the dwarves and I like human stuff. 
but I printed it because I wanted another tower. Uh, but there you go. This is another printablescenery.com model. Uh, you can buy these models individually, but really uh, what I would recommend, if you like the elf or the dwarf, for example, they have a whole bunch of dwarven terrain that matches this look and feel. Same with the elven. So if you like one, I recommend buying all the models, and I think they bundle them. I think you can buy like all the elf models bundled and save a little bit of money. This one by itself, if you just want to buy it by itself, I think it's $15. Uh, they sometimes have sales, so you can keep your eye open for that. Uh, same with the Dwarf Tower. That one is, um, I believe, $15 for the model. But I backed it as a Kickstarter. So I got all the elf stuff, all the dwarf stuff, and they have a demon tower and terrain. Uh, and I got all three plus all their add-ons. It was a Kickstarter or whatever. And it was like $100, and that sounds like a lot. But I got like, I don't know. 8 to 10, let's say 8 to 10 per per theme, so 10 times, about 30 models, anywhere, somewhere between 25 and 30 models uh, between the three different styles, and I can print those as much as I want, as many as I want, and um, I'm getting ready to start printing up more of the dwarf towers. There's, there's these battlements and little mini towers and uh, just a whole bunch of stuff, and when it's all painted up to look the same, it's going to look phenomenal on the desktop. Uh, and I'll probably use it like for a Frostgrave game here and there. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, <laughs> do you craft miniatures? Uh, short answer, no. Um, where did you learn 3D modeling? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mentioned it with a previous question that I studied engineering. Uh, we touched on CAD. I took an engineering drawing course. I forget the name of it. And uh, we did a lot of drawing by hand, but then we got a little bit of training in CAD. Now, this was 20 plus years ago. Um, AutoCAD, I don't even think AutoCAD was around. If it was, it was in the millions of dollars and most schools probably didn't have access to it. These days, um, you can get free CAD like Tinkercad or Fusion 360. Um, there's, you know, professional versions like Rhino and AutoCAD and, and others. Uh, I learned a little bit of CAD in college, and then I didn't really touch it for a while. And then a book publisher wanted uh, a book written on a, a beginner CAD level. And the only one that I could find that was free, because, you know, when you write a book, you, you don't want the person reading the book to have to go spend $100 or $500 on software. Um, I mean, they do have books like that, but this was for like a home hobbyist or a novice. So I went diving around and uh, I had been very fortunate that I had been in California. This was back in like, man, 2013, 2014. Uh, I went to Maker Faire in California, San Mateo, and there was a company showing off their stuff called Tinkercad. Now at the time, they were Tinkercad. They were not affiliated with, any, with anyone else. Um, later on, AutoCAD, yes, AutoCAD bought uh, Tinkercad. Uh, and brought it into their um, realm of products, but they've they've kept it free. But I cut my teeth on Tinkercad. I learned that uh, CAD application inside and out. I spent hours and hours learning every little thing I could about Tinkercad. And even then, I couldn't keep up because at least quarterly or twice a year, Tinkercad adds new features or new abilities, and I have to go and you know relearn those. But at the time I wrote the book, I wrote. Um, I wrote a pretty comprehensive book on Tinkercad, and in order to do that, I had to become sort of an expert. Now, I'm not an expert in modeling. Like, if you handed me something real complicated like like that, you know, I could get pretty close. It would take a long time for me to model something like this in Tinkercad, but it could be done. But what I got with Tinkercad was just enough skill with it to, to be able to do interesting things that I want to do. I certainly couldn't craft a miniature or you know, something very, very complex, although there are people who do it. And while I'm on Tinkercad, I should mention there is a, um, there's a, a, a designer, his name is Sable Badger, S-A-B-L-E-B-A-D-G-E-R. He uploads a lot of his stuff to Thingiverse.com, which is a free library of 3D models that people have created. He uses Tinkercad and he does stuff that's a little beyond my uh, skill level. I mean, I could probably get there, but I'd have to spend some serious time catching up. He's been designing spaceships and terrain and, uh, look him up, uh, good stuff. Um, but anyway, yes, I, I learned 
in college a little bit, the terminology and 3D rotation and things like that. But I really learned when I uh, took a deep dive into Tinkercad and it is still the CAD application that I recommend. If you've maxed out your, your capabilities with Tinkercad, the next one I would tell you to go to is Fusion 360, which you can get for free if you're a hobbyist. You're not supposed to design stuff and sell, you know, that you've made with it unless you buy the, the pro version. But, um, yeah, look it up. Tinkercad.com is the website. It's a browser based CAD application. You don't even have to install any software. Uh, Fusion 360 is an application that you download and install and it runs on them all. Windows, Mac. I, I believe it runs on Linux. I think so. Next question. Oh, this one. Uh, I'm trying to remember who sent me this one. His name was Jake, I think. I'm thinking of doing a newsletter. Any advice? Okay. <laughs> a newsletter. Um, well, I think you probably asked that because you know that I produce the Bexham's Bazaar crafting magazine once a month, or at least that's why I'm assuming you would think I would have advice on a newsletter. Bexham's Bazaar originally started as an idea for a newsletter. I sent like a, an ugly PDF version of it to like Bill and V and I, maybe Jeremy. I, I can't remember who all I sent it to. And I just said, Hey guys, I'm thinking about doing this. Would, would you be interested? And, um, oh, it was hideous. Hideous. And, uh, I wasn't happy with it, let alone asking people for feedback because I knew that they would either be brutally honest that it's horrible or they would be very nice and say, Oh, it's a great idea, but secretly they're going horrible. So rather than put people on the spot, I started digging into magazine creation software and I found a lot. There's a lot of those out there. And, uh, I use one called, I use one from a company called Lucid. And, uh, but anyway, newsletter. I can't speak to a newsletter because I never produced one. But it, but the advice I can offer sort of comes through my experience, um, with the magazine. And all I can tell you is if you're going to do a newsletter or a magazine, uh, the one thing you are going to have to do is be consistent. I set a goal of releasing each new issue on the first of the month. And let me tell you, there's been some times where it's been right down to the line uh, where I was just cranking away work the night before. But, um, you know, a newsletter is probably going to be two pages up to maybe 10 or 15 pages. I don't know if you're talking about a print version that would be mailed out, but let's assume you're talking about a digital version. You know, with a digital version, there's no weight to it. It's just length of pages and, and, and maybe a megabyte count. But so I think those worries are out. So producing a newsletter is probably pretty easy. You could just use any kind of word processing software to do it. So I, I you know, I, that's, you'll just need to get, if you're not good with that, you'd have to get a book on Word or pages or whatever you're going to tool your Adobe. Um, Adobe puts out one called InDesign. That's it. InDesign. Um, you know, whatever you're going to use, you're going to have to get skilled with it. Keep learning. And I'm still learning with the software that I'm using with Lucid. So, uh, about the only advice I can tell you is, is be consistent. Okay. If you're the one putting the content in there and no one else, uh, you know, you're going to have to, it's going to take work. I mean, writing, I don't know about you, but I'm a writer for a living and it still takes me time to produce a four or five page article and edit it and make sure it reads and flows right and the style's consistent and things like that. So um, I think newsletters are outstanding. I wish our hobby had more of them. Uh, if you're gonna do one, maybe try doing one quarterly at first or, or monthly if you think you can handle it. But um, newsletters are interesting because they can be delivered via email or you know uh, some other service. But it's it's uh, you can squeeze a lot into you know ten or twelve pages, and um, people will sign up. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't take any storage space, so they can always read it and then delete it out of their inbox, or they can print it out if they want a print copy. But I think newsletters are an interesting idea if you are really serious about doing it. Uh, I highly encourage it because I, in our hobby, gaming, crafting, whatever, you know, the gaming hobbyist uh, circles, um, there's not enough. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of YouTube channels, but we don't have a lot of, um, of reading, print, printed material or reading material. Websites do count, 
But uh, you know, I like to I like to have magazines on my iPad. I like to read newsletters, uh, the ones I subscribe to. I like to read them on my iPad when I'm traveling or, or what have you. So go for it. Um, I I wish I had more advice for you other than just keep it simple at first. Don't overwhelm the reader with a lot of uh, artwork on every you know every other paragraph. Don't drop artwork. You know, if it's a newsletter and it's supposed to be informative, stick to information with a few scattered pieces of artwork here and there. You're gonna have to come up with some creative ways to generate income. And that could be maybe selling an advertisement or two in the newsletter, and that could take time to find advertisers. Final question, awesome. What is your favorite material to work with and why? I think it's gonna be an even split uh, between chipboard and XPS foam. XPS foam is the stuff you can buy in the hardware store. It's used for insulation. Uh, it's not the soft white foam that you get in like packaging that just breaks real easy and, and it fragments into the little snow pieces and stuff. Not that junk. XPS foam, you cut with a blade. Uh, I usually have, I'm, I'm looking over there and over there, you can't see it, but over here I've got a stack of quarter inch foam, uh, two by four sheets. I also keep on hand quarter inch XPS foam, and over here I have the thicker one inch foam. My hardware store luckily sells the one inch foam in two by four sheets. So chip, I mean, um, um, XPS foam, hands down, crafters gold. After that, um, I had always used chipboard, just never really knew the name of it. I always called it cereal box um, cardboard. You know, it's a, it's a little thicker than regular cardstock paper but it's brown and that pulpy cardboardy, but it doesn't have like the uh, the corrugation in between layers. Uh, it was um, Bill at Wildlock's Armory that finally put me on to the fact that you could buy it in bulk. He um, he has a link over on Wildlock's Armory's website where you can get it. I recommend you go to, through him because he gets an Amazon um, affiliate link. He makes a you know 20 cents, 50 cents when you buy a pack of it. I think they you he he uses the graphics G R A F I X I believe is the name brand that's the one I buy. It's called Graphics Medium Density Chipboard, and you can get a big stack of I think twenty five of sheets for ten to twelve dollars. And I always have I've got one over there I've got one stack of twenty five over there and a small fragment of stack over here. I burn through that stuff. Um, I use it. I use it all the time for greeblies, greebles, you know, to add detail to stuff. I use it as um, the base to glue foam onto. Uh, if you take a look back a few videos at my, um, the I, I made a small spaceship. Uh, it was um, made out of chipboard uh, with a foam base. Now flip that, and recently I made a, a set of ruins just a couple videos back. It had foam as the base, and then I used chipboard for the inner structure, and then I glued foam over it, so I kind of reversed it. So depending on what I'm going to be making, the chipboard may be 90% with foam 10%, and it could be reversed. It could be all, all foam with just a little bit of chipboard thrown in. So it's just whatever, um, whenever I'm making a project, I sort of try to figure out which balance of that material is gonna be needed. And, uh, and I try to keep it always on hand because I, I, I tend to always need one, both. I just don't know the quantity, so I try to keep it in stock. Wow, I don't know how many questions that was. Uh, Jeremy did a hundred one last week and uh, I, did, <laughs> I wasn't even gonna try to do a hundred questions. I may have done 30 or so, but uh, I appreciate your patience in giving me a week off with my oldest son going camping. Um, by the time you're watching this, I should be coming back. And so there'll be a regular crafting video next week. But I hope these questions um, provided you with a little bit of uh, background on me. I hope they provided you some insight into the things I do and how I got where I am. Uh, I hope some of them provided you advice on doing the things you want to do, whether it's making something or maybe a newsletter or you know a, a, a magazine or a channel. Uh, I can tell you that those of us who do YouTube crafting channels, uh, I think we all agree that the hobby could use uh, many more. So uh, if you are thinking about starting a crafting channel, please do it and uh, let me know, let some of the others know. And once you get, once you get going, uh, reach out to us and we'll help, we'll help promote your channel if we see that you are 
you know, producing content on a regular basis. I've, I have subscribed to a number of channels, crafting channels that got off to a good start and then fizzled. They, they haven't released, um, stuff in, in quite a while. Um, now they may have their own reasons. I announced a, a, a medical leave and took some time off. Some people don't share that kind of information. So, you know, it's possible some of these channels will come back in time, but I do know that some channels have just fallen away and, um, you know, you got to have the passion and the interest and, uh, it's got to be something you enjoy doing or else you're going to get really bored. Uh, and, and it helps if you're playing games because like me, I tend to make things that are going to benefit either my Dungeons and Dragons game or my wargaming hobby. So, that's all I have for you. Thank you again. Uh, this will be episode 102. I'm still blown away that I've reached over 100 episodes and I uh, couldn't have done it without you guys supporting me and encouraging me and uh, giving me feedback on how to make improvements and things like that. So thanks again. Uh, I might do another one of these Q&As down the road. I certainly won't make these uh, a regular thing. I know that they aren't as fun as watching somebody make something. The way YouTube works, uh, you want to keep videos coming on a regular rate in order for them to push up your channel in the search results. And so, you know, I've just gotten back. I fell real hard down the search results. If you Google something like DIY terrain or gaming terrain or whatever, um, I took a tumble way down and I knew that was coming. It was okay. So it's going to take a little while for me to build back up so that when people come and do a search for, you know, D&D, dungeon tiles, uh, you know, I'll show up in the first 10 or 20 or so, but, um, that's something else to think about. You get, you want a channel, you want to get found, you have to produce consistently or, um, or at least in a large number. When you get up in Scotty's numbers and, you know, 600 videos and stuff, you're going to get found. Uh, but if you're just starting out, you're going to, you're going to be a needle in a haystack. So you to help, help move yourself up. Uh, you're going to want to produce pretty consistently. All right, that's all I have for you. This is DM Jim. I am going to see you next week with a new craft. Y'all take care. Bye.